Hi, everybody. I'm very sorry that I was unable to be with you in person, but I'm grateful I'm able to give my lecture via video. The title of my lecture is The Problem with the Evidence in Cancer Medicine. And I'm Vinay Prasad. I'm an associate professor here at OHSU. In terms of disclosure, my work is funded by Arnold Ventures. I'm the author of two books that are published by Johns Hopkins University Press, Malignant is Forthcoming, and I host a podcast called Plenary Session, which is on the iTunes store. And I'm active on Twitter at that handle. In this talk, I hope to just get across three ideas. One, is progression-free survival and response rate, are those endpoints meaningful or are they merely measurable? Has crossover in clinical trials led us to underestimate good drugs? And how successful are the genome-targeted cancer drugs? I hope, if we have time, that we'll get to the third one, but I know my time is limited at 30 minutes, so I'll stick to the time. So I guess I wanted to start with the case. This is uh, of a patient, uh, like so many patients I've seen, don't worry, uh, no HIPAA violations, um, who I took care of uh, about uh, eight years ago. Mr. Jones was a 75-year-old gentleman who uh, complained to his doctor about some intermittent epigastric pain and a five-pound weight loss. And so, what do you think the doctor did? Well, Mr. Jones' doctor did what I think most primary care doctors would do for a 75-year-old with an unintentional weight loss and abdominal pain. He put him in a scanner. He got a CAT scan. And the CAT scan showed two lesions on the CT scan and also um, some suspicious uh, swelling in the pancreas, all labeled here. Um, so these were the images Mr. Jones had. And of course, um, with the help of the wizards in interventional radiology, we performed a needle biopsy of one of the liver lesions and the pathologist gave us the results. This was well-differentiated pancreatic neuroendocrine carcinoma. It was a non-functioning PNET tumor. Uh, and it had spread to the liver and was deemed unresectable by the surgeon. The year, of course, was about a decade ago, 2010. And based on the 2010 guidelines by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, uh, this patient would fall here. He had local, regional, or unresectable disease and or distant metastases, but he was fairly asymptomatic. His belly pain actually spontaneously resolved, and he had a low tumor burden, and the disease, for all we knew, had been stable. And so the NCCN recommend to observe with markers and scans every 3 to 12 months and follow him until he had clinically significant progressive disease. And in fact, that's what we did. So throughout 2010, we got CAT scans and CAT scans and we followed the tumors. And, you know, we were fairly reassured by tumors that weren't changing too dramatically on CAT scans. A year later, however, 2012, we got some good news. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration's Oncology Drug Advisory Committee meeting had a meeting to discuss Everlimus, a new targeted cancer medication for PNET, and they concluded 10 to 0 that the drug had a favorable risk-benefit profile. And they did so on the basis of randomized controlled trials that showed an improvement in progression-free survival. And these are the Kaplan-Meier curves. This is Everlimus versus placebo in patients just like our patient with metastatic or unresectable, well-differentiated PNET. And you can see here, the median was improved from 4.6 months to 11 months with Everlimus, a hazard ratio 0.35, which many oncologists would say is very good. Overall survival is not the primary endpoint of this study, and it was quite notable it really showed that Everlimus and placebo were really neck and neck. The hazard ratio was 1.05, and there didn't appear to be any superiority for Everlimus. And so the NCCN guidelines two years later updated it, and they said for patients with symptomatic or clinically significant tumor burden or clinically significant progressive disease, you could consider Everlimus or another drug, Sunitinib, which also was approved, or cytotoxic therapy. So it was added to the guidelines. And we got another CAT scan, and uh, Mr. Jones had been reading about this drug, and we thought, you know, maybe, maybe these tumors are getting a little bit worse. It was hard to tell, but it was possible. So Mr. Jones asked me a very good question. Should I consider taking Everlimus? And I told him that, look, you know, I have to be honest with you. I've done a deep dive into the evidence, and I know that the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee meeting is favorable for this product, but I have some doubts. I note that overall survival, 
which is really the endpoint you care about most, that there's no evidence that this drug improves survival. And in fact, while on study, there were 12 patients in the Everlimus group who died, while only four died in the placebo group while receiving the study drug. There appeared to be an excess of deaths from taking this drug during the administration of the agent. I also pointed out that Everlimus was, although labeled a targeted drug, it was not an easy pill to swallow. It was associated with stomatitis, rash, diarrhea, fatigue. Many patients find it to be a very difficult to take drug. Some find it even intolerable. Mr. Jones asked me, but you know, doc, I keep seeing this progression-free survival benefit. This is what the company is saying is, uh, is important, uh, what the drug provides. Can you tell me what is progression-free survival? I said, okay, sure, I'm happy to explain that. Um, so, you know, imagine I were to take that CAT scan and I were to kind of draw a circle around all the lesions in, uh, on, on your CAT scan. This was the initial tumor measurement. Well, progression-free survival is the time until one of a few things happens. One, unfortunately, you might pass away. The time until you pass away, if that's the first thing that happens, that's considered a PFS event. You might have new lesions on the CAT scans. We might see a nodule in the lungs that we didn't see before or see a new spot in the liver, and that would be considered a progression-free survival event. Then you might have something called progressive disease, which means that the tumors get about 20% bigger in diameter, and that's called progressive disease. And then there's one more possibility, which is that your tumors might initially shrink on Everlimus, and if they shrink more than 30%, we call that a response, a partial response. And if they later grow 20% from the smallest they ever were, they'd still be smaller than the original tumor size, but we would consider that progressive disease. And so progression is one of these four things happening. Uh, the person could pass away, there could be new lesions on the scans, it could get bigger, or there could be a response and then progression. It's kind of a confusing endpoint. You know, so what do you need to know about progression-free survival? Well, you need to know that it is something we can measure. It can be measured and quantified. It depends on the frequency with which we deploy our scans. Different people measure it differently. You know, measuring a tumor on a CAT scan, that's not like measuring your height. That's like measuring the width of a cloud between your fingertips. It's not a direct measure of how a patient feels or functions. And it's technically something we call a composite time to event endpoint. It's the time until one of several things happen. <clears throat> Mr. Jones fires back, well, doc, you said that a response is considered 30% tumor shrinkage, but that kind of sounds arbitrary to me. Why 30%? Why not 40% or 50%? Where do these numbers come from? And I said, well, Mr. Jones, that's a good question. So you got to go back a little bit in history to the 1970s when this great physician, Charles Mortel, who was a Mayo Clinic oncologist, gathered together 16 oncologists and 12 spheres to take 1900 measurements. And here's what he did. He found 12 solid spheres that were between 2 and 14 centimeters in diameter, and he put them on a layer of foam rubber. And he put, put, them, sorry, put them on a mattress and he covered them with a layer of foam rubber. And the foam rubber was half an inch thick to simulate the skin and subcutaneous tissue, and it was one and a half inches thick to simulate the abdominal wall. And then 16 experienced physicians practicing in oncology were asked to measure the diameter of each sphere using the equipment that he employed in clinical practice, the ruler or caliper. Of course, unfortunately, in the 1970s, it was all men who were gathered for this event. And two of the marbles, the masses under the foam rubber were actually the same size and another two were the same size as well. And this was the key insight because Dr. Mortel wanted to know how often the same person and different people measure the same tumor as similar and how often do they appreciate the same changes in tumor size. And here's really what he asked. He asked, how often do two different investigators think the same tumor was actually different? And that depended on whether or not you would consider a 25% or a 50% difference as different. And how often did they think, how often did the same investigator think the same tumor was actually different? And that was really what he was testing. And that is where he got his cutoff, that the bi-dimensional measurement should be 50% smaller. It was because that was the cutoff with which two people and the same person could reliably tell marbles apart when measured through foam rubber with calipers. So in other words, these cutoffs, which have been passed along 
for all these years and are still codified in our modern response criteria, they were chosen for operational reasons, not because they told us something about how well people did, but because they could be reliably told apart by men through foam rubber using calipers. Ah. But Mr. Jones had a good follow-up question. He said, you know, Dr. Mortel used a 50% cutoff, not 30%. You know, what do you think about that, Doc? I said, well, that's a good point. Well, one thing you should know, though, is that the initial response criteria used a bi-dimensional measurement of 50% for the response, and this was the WHO. We have replaced it with resist, where we use a unidimensional 30% measurement. But the bottom line is the volumetric change is about the same. And so that's why it's 30% today, because we are measuring in one dimension, not two. So that's the little technical aside. So Mr. Jones said to me, you know, it's no wonder that progression-free survival doesn't capture how I feel, but surely drugs that improve progression-free survival go on to extend lives. Surely that's the case. Well, not so fast. This was a paper we published a couple years ago in JAMA Internal Medicine, where we asked that question. If you look at all surrogate validation studies, how well do these surrogates in cancer medicine predict subsequent overall survival? Here's what we found. You know, you need to know how we do these studies. And so I'll just give you one quick example. You know, imagine you wanted to know if progression-free survival predicted overall survival in metastatic breast cancer. The first thing you do is you assemble a list of all the studies that have been published on the topic. And here imagine that there's two such studies. One, where progression-free survival goes from three to six months and overall survival goes from 18 to 21, and another where it goes from one to two and OS goes up a month from 12 to 13. And what you do is you plot the change in progression-free survival on one axis and the change in overall survival on the other axis, and each dot is one independent randomized study. And the question here that's being asked is, what percent of the variability in survival is captured by variability in the surrogate? And you perform linear regression. And these are the correlation coefficients recommended by the German ICWIG group. And I actually tend to favor that, that until your R coefficient is about 0.85, it's not really a strong correlation. I think the takeaway here is that you want most of the variability in survival to be captured by variability in the surrogate in trials testing new treatments. So what happens if you look at the landscape of all the surrogates we use in cancer medicine? And my postdoc, now faculty at University of Oklahoma, Allison Haslam, did just that. This is an arrow diagram that she made uh, with the help of Spencer Hay. Uh, and what you see here is a timeline from the upper left to the upper right, which is uh, five years, from 2000 to 2020. And every diamond is a surrogate validation study. The red diamonds are negative studies. There's poor correlation. The green diamonds are strong correlation. And yellow is in between. The size of the diamond tells you how many data points are there. Of course, if you do a regression with just two data points, it's always going to be a perfect line. So you really want bigger diamonds to show that you've looked at many randomized control trials. And I think what you see here is that one, our enthusiasm for surrogate validation has gone up and up and up, especially in recent years. And two, there's a whole bunch of red. A lot of these studies are negative. We summarized it in one of the figures of the paper where we say, you know, depending on which situation you're in, adjuvant, metastatic, locally advanced, or immunotherapy, um, you know, there's different correlations. And in the metastatic setting, the correlation between progression-free survival and response rate and survival tend to be low, some medium, few or high. And I guess I would say it would be one thing if we approve drugs based on surrogates if we later followed up to see if they improved survival. This was an analysis I did with Chul Kim and colleagues that appeared in JAMA Internal Medicine, where we followed out drugs approved on the basis of surrogates five years into the future. And we asked how many of these drugs later showed a proven survival benefit. And the answer was just a paucity, just about 15%. Whereas most drugs either didn't show a survival benefit in randomized trials, or there was no published data looking at survival into the future. So I told Mr. Jones, you know, PFS generally does not predict overall survival. But I got to be honest with you, there is no data for your specific tumor, which is a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor that is well differentiated. There's no data in that situation. But as a general rule, it doesn't predict OS. So what did Mr. Jones decide to do? I told him 
there were some more numerically more deaths while on study drug. This drug did improve progression-free survival, but at a hefty price of stomatitis and diarrhea. Um, progression-free survival has a generally poor correlation with overall survival. And so I think Mr. Jones decided to do what many people feel compelled inexorably to do, which is, let's give it a try. You know, I mean, I think this is the this is the nature of regulatory science. When you approve drugs, it is very difficult for people, even with perfect understandings of what drugs have been shown to do and not to do, it's very difficult for them to say something other than, well, let's just give it a try and see how it goes. And in fact, I think this is sort of the mantra of modern oncology. And he gives it a try. And one month later, he comes back to me and he says, I feel, then he uses a word I'm not familiar with, worse. So I, I don't know, it's a very unusual thing he said to me, but he really didn't feel good. And he threw the pills away and he never took them again. And a couple years later, without any treatment, we got a CAT scan. And, you know, I think it's still very difficult to know if it has changed too much over this time. So Mr. Jones came to me a couple years later, and he was a little bit upset about what I had told him. Uh, he found this ad in uh, an article in a magazine he was reading, and this was about that drug, Everlimus. And it was about pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, PNET. And it said that the final overall survival results from that study were there. That study where, you know, initially they found no survival benefit. And there was a 44-month median overall survival advantage with Affinitor compared to 37 months. And it's called, it says here, clinically meaningful improvement in median survival, shown here in yellow. A 6.31 meaningful improvement in median overall survival. And he said, you know what, doc, you're wrong. Just because you look at the studies doesn't mean you know the truth about every drug, and this drug has a clinically meaningful improvement in survival. And maybe I should have stuck with it a little bit longer. And I said, you know, I really want to see that ad. I mean, I haven't heard this at all. I, I keep up with the literature, and this is news to me. And so I looked at that ad, and I really squinted at it, and I saw something. I pulled it up on my website. I said, what's that at the bottom? What's that? I blew it up. It says, not statistically significant, but clinically meaningful. Not statistically significant, but clinically meaningful. I thought that this is sort of, this is the most emblematic example of the world we're living in in modern oncology. Our standards are so low. Our drugs are so marginal. They have such great toxicity, and they're brought to you wrapped in hype. So much hype that people can say, without any shame, that something is not statistically significant, but it's clinically meaningful, which is a, a, a characterization of the overall survival that I would dispute. Because in fact, it's not significant because there's no overall survival advantage and you know anyone can, can pick whatever point on the curve they want to highlight, but that doesn't mean it's a reliable finding. So I, I would disagree with this. But the reason the authors say that we're not statistically significant is because we had crossover. When patients on the control arm had progressive disease, many of them were allowed to take Everlimus. And I thought that this is actually, you know, a very interesting point. So, you know, we talk about crossover so much in modern medicine, and I think it means different things. Of course, in a psychiatric study, it means something very different than it does in cancer. In cancer, it really means one thing. It means unidirectional crossover from the control arm to the experimental agent. So imagine patients with cancer, we randomize them to the drug or the placebo. When they have progressive disease, patients on placebo are allowed to take the experimental drug, but not vice versa. So this is typically what we mean by crossover. Shown another way, when patients who get the drug pr progress, they get the standard of care therapy. When patients who get placebo progress, they get the study drug. So that's, that's crossover design. And I think that crossover is so misunderstood because it isn't always bad, it isn't always good, uh, but sometimes it's bad and sometimes it's good and sometimes we get it and sometimes we don't and we have errors of all sorts. So let me show you a little table how I think about it. I think about situations where crossover is desirable. I think about situations where it is undesirable, where you don't want it. And then sometimes I note you get it and you don't get and sometimes you don't get it. And it turns out we have these two things in oncology. We want crossover and we get it. That's good. We don't want it and we don't get it. That's also good. But we also have situations here where we wanted it and we didn't get it. That's bad. 
and we didn't want it, and we got it, and that is also bad. And so, you know, for the sake of the time we have, which is just 10 more minutes, I'm just going to talk about one category, the Everlimus category, which is Everlimus has crossover in that study. But did we want it, or did we not want it? That's the question. And I'm going to use a different example to kind of make this point, because I think this makes the example super clear. This is Cipolucil T. It's a cancer therapeutic vaccine. It's not a vaccine for a virus. It's a vaccine we give people who already have cancer in the hopes that will stimulate their immune system to attack their own cancer. And in the randomized trial that led to drug approval, Cipolucil T had 0% response rate. Nobody had their tumor shrink. It had no difference in progression-free survival against placebo. But in terms of overall survival, it had a four-month improvement from 22 to 26 months-ish, overall survival advantage. And this is the curve shown. And it led to regulatory approval, and it became uh, a widely used medicine for a period of time. It's a bit unusual because it's the only cancer therapeutic vaccine in history to be approved. It's not, And that's not for lack of trying. It's the only one that's ever shown a benefit. It is a strange cancer drug. It has a survival benefit even though it has no responses and no change in the time to progression. In other words, it has no activity against cancer. But it does have that four-month survival gain. So what was the design of this study? They took patients with metastatic castrate-sensitive prostate cancer. They randomized them to Cipolucil T or placebo. And when patients progressed on these agents, they got different things. On the Cipolucil T arm, they got docetaxel, which is a proven life-prolonging therapy. On the placebo arm, they got a frozen Cipolucil T when they progressed. This was the unidirectional crossover. And when they progressed again, they got docetaxel, which is a proven life-prolonging therapy. And it turns out that because of this design, there was an imbalance. 57% of people who got Cipolucil T got docetaxel, and only 50% of people on the placebo arm. The time to docetaxel was 12 months in the Cipolucil T group and 14 months in the placebo group. And I've shown that here on the picture, that a larger percentage are getting docetaxel than the control arm, and it happens faster, 12 months versus 14 months. So now imagine that it isn't Cipolucil T I'm giving a patient, but rather a glass of milk. If I randomize people to a glass of milk or a glass of water, and when they progress, if they got milk, they get docetaxel. But if they got water, they get a glass of milk. And then only if they progress again, they get docetaxel. You can see here that even milk might show a survival advantage because in one arm, you're getting more docetaxel up front. And in the other arm, you're getting less of it at a delay. And docetaxel is already a life-prolonging therapy. And that's in fact what the AHRQ thought when they looked at this data. They said, we cannot exclude the fact that survival benefits in the absence of response rate or progression-free survival is actually due to harm towards the control group from getting a delay in chemotherapy due to getting an ineffective frozen salvage product, which is the frozen Cipolucil T. Okay, so I guess the last thought I had here was to bring it back to Everlimus. Why is it the case that we didn't want crossover. Well, in cancer medicine, you don't want crossover in situations where you're testing the fundamental efficacy of a novel drug. And if you do have crossover and there's no survival advantage, you cannot, you cannot conclude that the drug would have had an advantage had it not been for crossover because it's equally plausible the drug would have had a decrement in survival had it not been for crossover. Uh, and it's also possible the drug has no survival benefit, that whatever gains in progression are offset by off-target toxicity. So you really don't want crossover in trials testing fundamental efficacy. The situations where you do want crossover are situations where you already know the drug has a survival advantage in a latter line, and you're testing the early upfront administration of the agent versus the administration on the back end. And in those situations, when we want crossover, we still don't always get it. So back to our patient, a few years further went along and we scanned Mr. Jones and I would be hard pressed to think that his tumors have changed that much. And that's the other bewildering thing about cancer medicine, which is that all cancers exist on a spectrum and there are people with indolent biology, slow growing tumors, and they will by definition have a long time to progression because it takes a long time for slow growing tumors to reach 120%. And yet, 
you can give them anything and think that by long PFS you're improving outcomes, but that might not necessarily be the case. So, you know, finally, after years of taking care of Mr. Jones, he came to me one day and he said that, Doc, I appreciate all the time you spend answering my questions. You know, uh, it, it's above and beyond. Um, you really have explained a lot of things to me. And as an oncologist, that's something that, you know, I try to take time to do personally. And I, I, I pride myself in, in making time for that because I think it's very important. But I told this patient that, you know, it's also something that in this world, spending time with a patient answering their questions, well, that's not statistically significant. But that is, in fact, something that's clinically meaningful. So I think that that's the real lesson of oncology, that there are things that are clinically meaningful that aren't subject to statistics, uh, but it's certainly not the survival benefit uh, of Everlimus. So, you know, thank you all for, for having me. I'm deeply sorry that I was unable to, to be there in person due to a terrible flight disaster. Um, and um, if you're interested in, in this topic and interested in this talk, um, you know, I encourage you to check out this book, Malignant, that should be coming out in April. I have this podcast on the iTunes store called Plenary Session, uh, and you can follow me on Twitter. So thanks so much for having me. And I didn't answer this question, but perhaps someday in the future. Doc, how come you never sequenced my genome? Well, that's a story for another day.